into the production. So, yeah, here we are. I've <laughs> <laughs> been a firefighter uh, since I moved over here from Chicago. Uh, joined the fire department in 2006. And uh, later became a medical first responder as well. That's the MFR. <laughs> both a chief and officer. And, uh, and then at a point of time, we, we found out that uh, data is very important in the fire service. And since I had a background in IT, then the chief said, ah, you are the IT director from now on. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's what I do most of the time now, making sure we get all the reports in and report back to state and federal government. Well, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, one of my favorite buildings is this building right here. I love what you do. Very important history is such an important thing. I learned that when I was sailing. When I was going around the world, how I valued history. Studied in the Bahamas, Venezuela, certain parts of the world, certainly in Europe. So back to the building, I'm speaking with Eric when we went, we did a kind of a test yesterday on our AV system. And Eric says, Craig, whatever you do, make sure you don't break the glass in the foyer if there's a fire. So I won't do that. <laughs> if I do, I will resign. <laughs> really happy, thrilled to be invited here and speak before you and share our experiences and the value of fireboats and the Marine Division of the Fire Department. So, a bit of background. Um, I don't want to bore you. I'll just touch on it. I needed to slow down years ago. My wife, Vicki, I didn't spend any time at home. Nobody gave me anything. I didn't even get it. Yeah. Like most of you. And one of my ways to slow down was go on board a sailboat. Vicki had tried to get me to do it for about three years. Finally, Vicki gave me an ultimatum. So I'm doing it with you or without you. She had a 100-ton captain's license. I had a lot of experience. She had a ticket, a certificate. <laughs> we wanted to go to places. Put the house for sale in Glen Ellen. And we took the kids, said you can bring anything you want on board a boat. We had a boat built. And anything you want to bring on the boat has to fit in the milk crate. <laughs> <laughs> there were eight and five. Yes, we homeschooled now. And we started going further and further. I still operated a couple of companies back in Illinois. So I had a very modest income, shall we say. So we found after the first year, which was the roughest, we got used to that lifestyle and started selling off things. And uh, Vicky wanted to do the South Pacific. I wanted to do Europe because it was cheaper to fly back. <laughs> and I wanted, it, I wanted uh, the history part of Europe. So we, uh, we were out about 10 years. And um, how do we afford that is usually one of the questions I get. We did our laundry in five gallon buckets, let me tell you. We had no refrigeration for a year and a half. We lived at Anchor for two years. That's how we did it. We wanted to do it. So as a result, I learned a lot. One of the things that, one of my great experiences with the Bahamas, I ended up, and I don't even know how it quite happened, on a rescue boat, a volunteer in Nassau, and it was usually charter boat operators, usually sailboaters, that got into the stress. So anytime in the middle of the night, they would come, because we were at, at anchor in Nassau, they'd pound on the boat, and I'd hop on board, and we'd go out and rescue the sailboaters. Never a power boat on the sailboat. <laughs> so, I got a great deal of experience in what to do and what not to do, and had a profound appreciation for the people that volunteered their time. And those experiences helped me to this day. I know what I did. So, um, we were in Europe when um, Vicky's parents got old, my parents were getting older, my dad had a heart attack, it was never really part of my life, told Vicky it's time to come back. And we came back. Um, she wanted to move to Florida, I wanted to move to Michigan because it was still close to my office in Wheaton, Illinois. Boating was still the predominant thing in our lives. So I answered an ad for the fire department because I figured they're never going to take me because I'm too old to join. Mm -hmm. And I was available during the day because I had retired. 
And that's how I got into the fire service. <laughs> and found this is my passion. This is what I want to do with the rest of my life. And I'm here before you, really, because of you guys. Because I love people and see them like what I do. So glad to be here. <laughs> represents the first fire boat. When I came on board in 2001, we had a river queen made locally. It's our marina. This is a sister ship to our first fire boat. We had outboard motors on it because they lost the engines. And we did not have this top deck. The boat sunk <clears throat> down the end of Griffith Street by Sergeant's Marina. Uh, one morning we found it on the bottom. <laughs> so it was an older boat, and it was all steel, busted through, and went to the bottom. So the hunt went on to look for a new vessel, new boat. And um, yeah, I guess we go to the next slide. Yeah. So the hunt went on for a new boat, and Chief Block at the time, in my view, this is one of his legacies. One of the best things he did for his citizens was buy this boat. The Coast Guard released about 10 of these boats locally. He had a bid on them. He was in the right place at the right time to purchase these. Very robust, built all throughout the United States, specced out boat, uh, all aluminum with a, a fiberglass superstructure. $2,500 was the price of the boat. <laughs> in contrast, my dinghy is 10 feet long with $6,200. <laughs> Tremendous value, cost $2,000 to ship it, came from Toledo, Ohio. I just kind of came on board, and of course I had an interest in boats, so I was kind of delegated to this, this area right here. So this is what um, most of them resembled. They were white. This is a little different yard built, this boat, because it has no rub rail. And this is what ours looks like nowadays. So we got the boat. This is what it looked like. The boat draws four feet. The street end near Sargent's in the Griffith Street was very shallow. So a hunt for a new dock <coughs> had to take place. And they decided at Lucy and Water Street to put in a dock. That's how we ended up moving, and that's what you're looking at right now. This is Mr. Harrington's building. This is a ramp, and this is a very used steel dock that I think is probably older than me that uh, was a floating dock that they did structurally. They supported it. Now the water's almost over it. <laughs> so that's the way the boat came in, uh, pretty much like that, and we put vinyl graphics on it <clears throat> to signal that it is. So what's great about the boat, not only the price, um, the capacity of this boat is immense. You can put, easily put 23 people on it and not even feel any of the effects of the amount of people on board. So it's tremendous capacity. It can go out in six to eight foot waves in Lake Michigan or an ocean. So that was important. We were vowing, you know, the board was vowing, do we go out of the breakwater? Do we not? Not everyone is meant to go out in the breakwater in these types of boats. I had a background in it. The board said, you bet. You can go out beyond the breakwater. But my target area, my priority concern is Kalamazoo Lake. The boat has capabilities of virtually anything. So we can see it's called Morgan J. Who was Morgan J? Any of you ever met him? He was a local guy. The canoe? The canoe? Today we have it on a permanent display at, at the museum. So the dugout canoe. And, and Morgan, he, uh, he loves uh, open water. He loves to pan around in his canoe and set, set out his traps. So he was always uh, up and down the river in his, uh, in his canoe. He was also a, uh, 
when he was not selling traps, he was also a firefighter. And later, when he uh, stopped being active as a firefighter, he became a fire board member. And, uh, and before that, he was actually a highly uh, decorated war veteran for the army. Uh, he, he joined the army for uh, the Korean War, and during the war, he uh, he was about three rock stars and one silver. So uh, I'll say that's quite an achievement. So. And before that, he was uh, in World War II, he was uh, in the merchant navy, so he was always with when there was water. Uh, was out there. <coughs>
So when I had it surveyed, I had to make sure the hull was sound. It's quarter inch aluminum. Sometimes they're thin, sometimes they're full dimensional. You don't know what, what occurred, electrolysis. Because I wanted to put a fire pump on it. The boat was equipped with a fire pump, about 275 gallons per minute. Grossly inadequate. The pump failed, it wasn't replaced. Then when we had that River Queen, we had two fire pumps on the stern. We refurbished those, put them on here, we could pump 800 gallons per minute. So the time came where we needed to decide do we replace the boat or upgrade it. Survey showed the boat was well worth investing. Hull was completely sound, no deterioration. So a capital improvement plan was created to put in a UL listed fire pump down below. So that was the next thing we started to do. And Eric Scott and Amford um, shot on this. Along with the fire pump project was cosmetically the boat was not only high maintenance, it was terrible looking. So we wanted to start making that right. So we put the building, the building, the boat in the back of our heated building, that's the story in itself. And we had a tower hauled out of the water and to our back building so we could start stripping all the knots, get off, strip all the paint off the railings because maintenance is a big thing. Why paint something? You have to maintain it. We're not in salt water, we didn't have to do it. So we hauled the boat to put it back in the building, we measured and go, yeah, it's really close. I think it's going to fit. <laughs> Thinking doesn't work real well. <laughs> so, a very experienced operator, Tower Marine, has it on a hydraulic trailer. Captain Betts, one of our foremost uh, officers, was there, and we couldn't squeeze it in the building, <laughs> which alters a lot of plans. <laughs> so, I'm going to throw Captain Butt, that's on the bus here, and he says, well, let's, let's spray the rub rail. Let's see if we can get some lubricant on it, because it's so close. <laughs> <laughs> They're laughing, but we did that. <laughs> so we actually had the operator pull up about 20 feet, got a little more speed up. <laughs> I'm sorry. i the rub rail, and then we bowed. The garage, that was unsupport, that was more support up so there, it was a header across there. So the garage door opening was like this, so we could squeeze it in. And after, I think I gained a uh, age a year on that. <laughs> That's how we got in the back of the building to work on it ourselves, keep it in the house, because that's our slow time of the year, keep the cost down. So we proceeded to strip everything. Was it easier getting it out? <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know why. <laughs> I do know why. I wasn't there. <laughs> I can't watch this. So, yeah. so again, this is, a, this is all aluminum oh, fiberglass superstructure. Yeah. We hired an out-of-work fiberglass repairman to fix this because we had some rot up here. This is a cord roof. I don't want to get bored with some of that stuff. And he worked on it, gave us a real good price, and... Um, the outcome was phenomenal. And here, interesting on the non-skid, I think this is really notable. So we had the Coast Guard being a government agency, you could buy all these, every one of these patterns is numbered. So we ordered a complete replacement kit. It was an interesting thing. Cheap, you could buy it from Costco, or you could buy it from a company that has blind people cut these out. Really? The choice is obvious. We're going to have blind people do this. Yeah. And that's what we did. We had hired a company that, to give these people work, they cut all this up. Phenomenal. Just one of those things you're like, wow, I couldn't do that probably with my eyes. So we just thought it was really cool the way uh, the Attention to detail and how it turned out was extraordinary, considering what it would look like. So again, this is with two old pumps on the stern of the boat, 800 gallon per minute. I'll give you a, what does that mean? The minimum gallon per minute for a house is 1,000 gallons per minute. So 800 is okay, not the greatest. 
20 years ago, you didn't need all that water. Now you do. Fuel loads are more. Why? Synthetics. Mm -hmm. Structures are bigger. When I came here, the average house was 4,200 square feet. Now it's over 6,000. So you have a lot of different dynamics where it was time to upgrade the boat. And I'm, the main purpose of the pump is coming up, too. So an aftershot, Eric, again, we had a monitor in the back. We have a remote control monitor there. The reason we had to do that was because this pump is so powerful, if the monitor was in the bow or out the stern, it turned the boat. Uh, pushes the boat. Nozzle reaction. So we had to have this engineer, and this was all the engineer of Wright and Douglas by Dave Anderson. <laughs> Phenomenal. We could not have built this without Dave Anderson. So that's a real important feature, and that's a $15,000 nozzle. Because it's all operated from within the cab. We didn't want to have the person up there blocking the view of the captain. And then this sprays water, and then also there's a number of nozzles that, that can be off the stern. You can take a nozzle hose, jump off, and then the best feature will be coming up in my opinion, the best feature. So this just shows in 2014, that's Dave Anderson, a couple of the guys, that's Captain Brett Maras, that's Patrick Boris. They cut this engineer, they cut the hole in the foredeck and dropped a Cummins diesel engine in there. All engineering, because we weren't sure, could the boat take the weight? And, and it could. So pretty significant project. I look at this and go, there's no way it's going to fit in there, but it did. Yeah. It was pretty awesome for Venetian Festival. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, was, it throws water from here. It's cool. it pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> so, and again, without this gentleman right here, none of this would have happened. We talked about taking it to Wisconsin to a company to have it, have it put in there. You know, it probably cost us $10,000 to get it there. So uh, this project was about $80,000 invested in the boat. A lot of money for us. We have a very large response area. We have a great need for different types of boats. The Morgan J2191 is a great boat for all this. And the primary reason the board was receptive to replacing the pump was this. I need that boat in season to augment the water supply. That pump is capable of pumping through a hose right here. It's called large diameter hose. It's five inch. And you can supply water to Butler Street, Water Street. You supply it to another engine, you relay. That was my main function of fire boat. Not so we could drive around. <laughs> I've done all that. It was so we could provide an augment a water supply in our downtown areas. You know that Morgan draws four feet of water. That's pretty rich for a boat. It's a lot of draft. We're lucky the water's up. So we can go anywhere here up to the bridge. So that's the primary vision I had with this fire pump was we need something to augment the water supply. Keep this in mind. You have a fire down on Water Street. You have a million gallon reservoir. Let's just say it's in the vicinity of Coral Gables. Okay? One of my big concerns is it's a big, tall structure, a lot of exposures. I have stuff that drifts across the river or into downtown Saugatuck. My concern is how long am I going to have enough water to put that out? I use two aerials on anything along that street. The aerials will out pump my water reservoir. I have to have something here. Of course, it's only good for the summertime. That's my high risk area. So it gives you a bit of hydraulic situation where you can pump, I can pump 3,200 gallons per minute with two aerials. I think I can supply 2,400 gallons per minute with a reservoir. So there's a lot of value into that $80,000. So it's important to understand that. 
But this whole area, and the other thing is, you know, how do you fight a fire here? By the time we drag a hose, there's no water supply here. It's, you've got the lake all over, but you've got to be able to get to it. To get to that body of water, you've got to draft it up. You've got to suck it out. You can't use hose like this because it collapses. So you use a hard suction. You're limited to about 20 feet. So you have to be close to the water's edge. So the fire boat, boats could come in and supply water to do a fire attack from land and from the water. So it kind of gives you an idea of what we've got going on. But the structures are my biggest concern. Because I either don't have hydrants down by the structures or I can't get to them. Take Saga to Yacht Service. We've trained there. The hydrants way down the street. You lay a hose like this, you charge it, you just block it off. You can't drive over it. Mm -hmm. You're done. So you have to be able to supply water for big fires. Imagine all the boat buildings we have. So you have fiberglass, gasoline, diesel, and LPG, which equates to a bloody lot of water. <laughs> So this gives you this great expanse area. That's just here. Lake Michigan's a whole nother ball game. But let's just focus on us right in town. And then the bridge, what we use there is another boat that you'll see a slide on. We call that 2192. It's a smaller boat. <coughs> I'm a real big person on working together, collaborating, and training together. We openly invited the dive team of Allegan County, we had two members of the fire department on Allegan County dive team. I was very reluctant to merge with the dive team because it took too many people out of service. But here's the deal. If I'm a member of the community down under the water, I have an obligation and a duty to act. And that's not standing on shore. I'm going to do something about it. The spoke gives me the platform to do it. Their knowledge base. Their boat is it. That's it. See why we have the Morgan J? Mm -hmm. The value in it is just indispensable. You can really put a lot of people on that. It's a great platform for diving. Matter of fact, there's one coming on Thursday. They asked if we would join them on Thursday. So again, another training session, working together. Without working together, I believe public safety is going to fail. And you have to you have to take that into consideration. Is this our fuel? You bet. It's out of my budget. Your money. But you know what? It's for those what ifs when you have to be out there. <coughs> so one of the great training evolutions we did is Captain Brett Van Oss came up. We borrowed a barge from Lake Construction, Al Vanderbeek. A real colorful guy. <laughs> no, he's, he's good to us. <laughs> we took a burn barrel, started it on fire, set it out in the middle of Kalamazoo Lake, and everyone had to take a turn. This is a monitor at Master Street. They had to take a turn getting that water in the burn barrel and put out the fire. It is not easy. Number one, this is more toward the stern, so to tend to move the boat. So the, the captain. The helmsman was always trying to move the controls, trying to keep the boat positioned. So it was painfully fun. <laughs> we just had a challenging time. We learned a lot on this. So we didn't want to just always use the monitor because if we have something big coming on, there's going to be water flowing from this boat all over. You can see there's a manifold here where you can run hoses off of that and run more nozzles. So that gives you an idea of what this is what they're doing. They're training in the lake on that barge. I, I couldn't resist in doing this. We are in some was out on the boat, and she, uh, of course, she never leaves home without the camera. So, <laughs> so she got this amazing shot of the oh. oh. rain. Oh. Oh. There's no other special stories that we can <laughs> Um, we have a great 
Allen County Sheriff's Department. We have a great Douglas Police Department. Matter of fact, Douglas Police gave us one of our votes. Um, I sold it to us so cheap. You'll see a slide come up on that. But this vote caught on fire. The sheriff, their boat is fast. The only downside of Morgan is it's a slow boat. And it, it draws a lot of water. It's a displacement hull. So when you can't go down the river full throttle, you know, they would remove me uh, from that position. And we don't do that. So we're real careful about this. This boat can get up on a plane and get there fast. It's like a scout boat. Then once they take over, they get there, we'll come up and follow them and supplement them if they need us. They ask us to follow them in tow in case the boat rekindle and start on fire again. So that's what's going on there. And very skilled operators, the county are phenomenal. And that's what I like about working together. Why all have the same boat? Why do that? You have this, we'll have that. And that's the way I believe we need to work, work. You shouldn't have all these, own all these assets that cost you and me a lot of money because I'm a resident too. So that's why I see working together with Alvin County, we very seldom work with the Coast Guard. And you may know this, speaking about working with people, the Coast Guard isn't even around Monday through Friday. They abandoned that post last year for a variety of reasons. So I originally had that with a couple of people. Well, just call the Coast Guard. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Let me know how that works out. Yeah. <laughs> Is that from both South Asian and from home that they're stopped? Yeah, they, I mean, they have coverage areas. South Haven has a very robust Marine Division. Um, South Haven and, and Saudi to share a lot of those, those experiences. But you'll, it depends on what the nature of it is. They'll send a helicopter if it's a missing person. But some of that's coming from Grand Haven. We've even had them come across the lake <laughs> from Wisconsin. So um, there is a Coast Guard station in, in Holland. We just never know where they're going to come from. And they have no fire boat capabilities. And they can go get a patient. Put them on board and they bring them to us. We rendezvous. That actually has happened several times. Because their boats are very fast. If we replaced Morgan J, it would be a much faster boat nowadays. Does that kind of answer your question? Okay. So, again, the fire boat, I wouldn't put in just any kind of pump, not a trash pump, but any UL is the fire pump. So you do a lot of research on NFPA. And that's a huge organization that sets standards that I have to follow, like what classification our fire boat is, which is dictated by the size of the boat and the capacity of the pump. And there's three primary reasons for a fire boat. We've kind of touched on them. Rescue operations, medical, transporting people to and from, and for marine firefighting. And my favorite is this one. Water supply for land-based operations. I didn't know that 15 years ago, folks. I didn't, I didn't realize that. So. Greg, how's your pickup on the, on the boat for pumping out of the water? How do you prevent trash? Poisoning? So there's an eight inch piece of pipe. They cut a hole in the hull. Pipe goes down, stands up. You can take the top off because it exceeds the water level. There's a strainer there. Then there's another uh, screen inside of that. And, and the original when the screen was built, it was too restrictive. So we had to have one redesigned. But it comes right out of the, the hull. And then the advantage of that long stack, we call it, is if you do have a jam, you're losing volume of water, you can take the lid off, stick your hand there because it pumps over here, and clear it. And with no impact on the This is how the water would get discharged to shore. Again, through that five inch large diameter, this is a connection valve right here. There's a pump that pumps underneath here. This is piped to here, and that's how they get it on shore. So many uses on this, you could dock it at the end of Brooks Park 
great kind of staging point. We actually pre-plan the boat would be staged at Weeks Park as we go to the seawall and run our lines um, to wherever we need it to relay. We have something big downtown. But that's our biggest issue. Where do we go? If you go to Singapore Yacht Club, where I happen to be docked, most of the boats stick out beyond the pilings. So then you've got to anchor. Try that with the boat moving and anchoring. And there may only be two people on this boat because I need them on land. And uh, it's supposed to go out with a crew of three unless it's an emergency. That's how the water gets to, the, to land. Have you had to use it? No. Thanks, Good. 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 So, what did the French fire department do? This is a sketch of what they actually did. This is a, a part of their report from the fire. They have a very talented firefighter who, instead of writing down what's happened, because that takes 200 pages, okay, he just sketched it all out like a, like a, a court, a sketch or something. Uh, so they have a boat down here, a fire boat in, in uh, and the river, and then they lay four of these all the way up the stairs up to a super bomber that takes those four intakes, and then they have four discharge that goes over to the fire scene. So that's how Paris Fire Department got that water, not from fire hydrant because. It was simply not enough, so they needed a very, very stable water supply. Because imagine if the fire department such a huge toll on on the water supply, what happens to the rest of the city? So, was it just one boat then that they used? Just one boat, four horses. And here it is. So, this is a small boat that pump a lot of, it must be one huge pump in there. <laughs> Keep this in mind, for every five foot of elevation, ten feet of elevation, it was five pounds of pressure. So, going out there, you had huge pressure plots. Well, what they did is they made up with volume of flow, which is a really good thing. This is just ingenious. And Eric discovered this. Just a great way of doing it. Probably kept Notre Dame from vanishing. And here we see the other hoses coming up. <coughs> they did uh, intake at, at the lower, and at this time, they, it's after the fire was knocked down, so they're, they're down to two uh, discharges now. So. so that's a bumper truck? That's a bumper truck. That's, um, uh, a specialized truck that the fire department has that is a large capacity foam engine, so they can also move a massive amount of foam because we can, we can start sending foam with water to those hoses and then it goes out to the, to the attack crew that has smaller hoses because nobody can hold this, nobody can lift it, nobody can move it when there's water in it. It is heavy. <clears throat> but obviously they were they were prepared for, for a situation like that, so they had the right equipment. And I don't know if anybody saw it. there was an interesting footage from inside the church where they had a remote controlled robot yeah. on the tracks. And yes. it had a, a, a nozzle in the front, so because the incident commander said nobody goes into the church now because the, the ceiling was coming down. So they sent this robot in to spray water inside the church and firebox standing out there with his uh, remote control. So, 
This is not salvageable, this is lost, but you gotta do is block the other ones. As I remember from Chief Block saying, they were running all over trying to keep things out. The Boy Scouts were on the other side, the Boy Scouts were on the other side of the river, putting out stuff that was starting up at Mount Ballet. But you certainly could have protected, you know, the neighboring uh, areas, and Chief Block did a great job of it. Yes? You mentioned, you want two aerials. What does that mean exactly? Yeah, I didn't. Um, ladder trucks, so elevated master streams. So the pre-plane that we've done since Chief Block taught me 20 years ago was you would bring an aerial down and put it on Butler Street, and then like say where Morrow's is, one would be on Butler Street, one would be on Water Street, because even if Morrow's is hard, that's like a square they closed off, and there's we can't get inside of it. So master streams, elevated master streams, flow a lot of water. So when you hook up two aerials, they pump so much water, you can deplete, overtax the water main. So these big buildings along here that are all wood, that's how we pre plan Because in downtown Saugatuck, you can build zero clearance. They're right next to one another. And those two our firewalls um, over the years get penetrated. Uh, is it possible that uh, should a fire occur on the lake shore in one of the residences that the boat could pull up because there is not enough water? That's a good question. The answer is yes. With the big fire boat, with 2191, you'd have to be pretty far out. 2192, a smaller boat, it's about 18, 19 feet long, that has a 400 gallon per minute pump. It can go into shallow water. So yes, we would take that in about three feet of water. And we would run hose to a manifold where we could split lines off there. Say McClendon's property, yeah. there's no water out there. That's how we pre plan that. Grasscook has two houses just north of Saugatuck on the lake shore. That's how we would fight those fires, providing it's in the summer yeah. and we don't have four to fives. Yeah. So, so we're very vulnerable out here. Yes, sure. Yeah. That's how we would do it. much water pressure. No, no. From the land. No, Shorewood is a real challenge. That so oh, yeah, yeah. You know, I can't even use... get a truck down there. No. Mm -hmm. That's why there's fire toads now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we know, but um, we, we train in there. It just depends on timing. The fires happen so fast. Here's the thing. When I grew up, everything was full dimensional lumber, right? Mm -hmm. Now it's glue and sawdust. Yeah. Yeah. This is yeah. fact. This is science. You have 25 minutes to get out of the house. You have three minutes now. Three minutes to get out of the house. That's a UL statement. They'll back that up because on new modern construction, or if you take furnishings that are up to petroleum, the BTUs are enormous. And the heat 
and the houses now are open concept, so the fire just rips. Mm -hmm. You know, come on, you know, some of these houses, they aren't houses, they're mansions. Yeah. They're six, seven, eight thousand square feet. The Dewgrass, the first house was 9,200 square feet. How am I going to put that out? They're, everyone wants big houses, that, that's okay. Mm -hmm. But I can't fight that with 900 gallons per minute. Hydrant infrastructure. But I'm expected to do it. So it's a real challenge. Fireboats can help all that. Particularly that middle one. Do we have a slide on 2192? Yeah, yeah. yes. Question, what about in the winter when there's ice? Are these boats capable of going through any ice at all? They're in storage. There is one ice rescue boat you'll see, and it's uh, a small one with no firefighting capability. It can go in open water and it can go on ice. It's dragged across the ice. Okay. But what they typically have to do, and we don't do it around here, they do it up in Beaver Island, Paw Paw area. They cut a hole in the ice and drop a line. The problem is, we can't get an engine close enough to do that. You can't drive on the sand or on the grass. The truck sinks. Yeah. And then the, the, the truck is inoperative. So we can't take it off of a hard surface. So this is by number 2192. We got this from Douglas Police. They had a Marine Division decided to give it up. They sold us a boat for $500. Sorry. Um, it's got a diesel engine in it right here, the same engine in my sailboat. My sailboat's 19 tons. So it's real powerful. It's a real heavy built boat. Then, before I came on board, they put a pump on the back of it. And the boat's pretty much out of trim. It's, 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 it's slow. It's faster than 2191, but it's slower and it's a jet boat. Um, it's at an age where it has to be replaced. All this is shot, the flotation here. But we can shoot a large amount of water here in my capital improvement plan of, of four years. Um, we schedule a replace that. I'm having Dave Anderson quote that now. That's what I would take to your lake shore thing. Because I wouldn't care if I have to beach it. What I have to worry about is sucking the sand. Yeah. But that can go in about 14 inches of water. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that the boat you use to protect Douglas? You talked about saga capture. This what you would get 2191 would be protecting would be protecting everything with west of the bridge. Everything west of the bridge. This would go up river. Like oh. the big boat, Morgan J would be to this, and, and 2192 would certainly be there as well. But the big boat can't get underneath the bridge. Right. So that 2192, that's where I see the need where we've got to get up here fast. The police can get up here fast. They have no firefighting capability. I'll bet you there's 1,500 slips in structure that there's no water supply mm. that are completely helpless up here. If the uh, um, community that's being uh, requested to pad those property uh, had a uh, the marina, would you be able to get in there and put out fire? Would there be a problem there? I've got to be careful how I answer that. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have no. It's public information. Here's, here's kind of the problem with that development that was not Mr. Padnos's fault at all. It was, I think you'd have to say, it was uh, the result of an agreement drafted by lawyers. There is no water supply there. The water supply is the lake. The problem is, the size of the houses, I can't suck the water out fast enough and pump it 3,000 feet in this. <clears throat> I can get in the marina if it's ever built. But the houses are what concern me. And in the marina, they would be required to put in a standpipe system, which is merely a series of pipes that we connect and run water from point A to point B. So the marina wouldn't be a big concern with me. The houses are a huge concern. But that, you know, we, we didn't heard of it because of consent judgment. And that consent judgment said they don't have to put in hydrants. There's water all around you. I'm telling you, I can't get to it. Yeah. Yes? For those of us who are not familiar 
familiar with your, what you're talking about. Where is that property? So, yeah, so you go out the river, if you went in from Lake Michigan, you just entered the breakwater on your left, on the north. You know, so we're working with Mr. Pedros, who's been re very receptive. Mr. Cle McClendon was great to work with. He's no longer with us. So we identified a problem. We did a lot of tests out there. And it's probably one of my three top concerns is how do I, how do I furnish water to these houses? So we're working on it. It's a work in progress. But, you know, the consent judgment uh, literally handcuffed me. But I was with the state. I was a state farm marshal when that occurred. I was not with the fire district. There's a meeting tonight to talk about it at the high school for those who are interested. Seven o'clock library. So that smaller boat would be used up river. For example, we had a boat fire on the river and the sheriff's department got up there and used an extinguisher. Boat was out, but very hot. They were worried about a flashing bag. So we got up there with the smaller 2192 and assisted it and docked it and uh, made sure everything cooled down and then we left. So a lot of real estate up here, a lot of uses, and that's why I want to get up there quicker than what I have the ability to do it right now. And I'll probably go with a 500 gallon per minute pump, which is great for two big large hand lines. It's, it's a good water supply. So this is that boat that can go on the ice mm -hmm. and go in there. Again, strictly rescue. This is a scout boat. Somebody's in the water, shallow water boat. The Morgan is the platform. So that would be the mothership out there. This would grab a person or victims and bring them for treatment to the Morgan J. That's what this boat is for. And you can see we bought this. It was a demo. Fourteen thousand, almost fifteen thousand dollars. That's a quick so You can see how much boats boats cost. But this has skids on it. Where we pull the engine off in the winter time, we put a small engine on it, and we can pull that engine off, throw it down there, and drag it across the ice, so we can transport people on if the ice is solid. If it's broken, we kick the motor up, we push it as far as we can, and we go in the water. And it's designed that you can pull people up here real easy. You know, people, um, when they're wet, they're very heavy, so it's hard to negotiate getting people in here. This boat's built for that. Just a go fast thing. And there's a time to go fast. You see these hoses right here? I talked about hard suction hoses that don't collapse when you suck water. Those are 10 foot sections. That's what we would use to suck water out of the lake. Example right there. So that diverse background having three boats, that's why. You can see an application of this smaller boat on the ice. Every winter we're out there doing this. For and hopefully we never have to do it. We've had people fall through the ice, usually they're going after their dog. And then they get in there and then they can't move. So Fortunately, we've been, our recovery has been great with all that. But just a great, great boat for that ability. Um, you know, I get, I get it often enough. Why do you have all these boats? Well, this is why. And nobody cares about it until they need, you need it. Then you don't care what it costs. <laughs> and I've had to change my boat budget, you know. Thank God for some of my board members like Dan. I had to change my boat budget from like $1,000 to $10,000 because I can't operate like this, you know? So, and we feel we spent it wisely. Give you another quick example. I thought about it. <coughs> Medicals. Probably the number one call for our fire district. 50, 55% of our calls are medical. So here's the situation. Somebody dies off a boat at um, the Old Harbor, you know, across from the Clemens and all that, snaps their neck. Still alive. Sheriff can get in and get them. 
because I can't take that big boat and beat you. I'll bend the props. He goes in, retrieves. Our people go with the sheriff, package that person, put them on a basket, Stokes basket, immobilize the patient, and we transfer from that boat to our boat where we can treat them. That's what it's like working together. That's how we coordinate that. They don't have the room to do CPR and that police boat. That's where we come in. Plus we're trained on that. So again, different boats for different purposes, different skill levels. Sheriffs do a phenomenal job getting there quickly. If they're around, they're not always around. So we had two instances like that last year where people dove in the water and got, got injured. So where are we going from here? One of the things I recognized was this dock was falling apart. Our marine contractor said in 2014, 15, he said I can no longer reset the stock. The ice would lift it out. We had, thank God, a couple of mild winters. So I began a capital improvement plan to replace the dock. And I will only put in a floating dock. Look out at the lake and you'll know why. <laughs> that being said, the ramp would get replaced, the dock would get replaced, and the boat should be with the current so we can demobilize and return quickly. So we would have a finger pier that goes off here. The city leases us this for a dollar a year. We've been here 20 years. So my plan is, I hope, God willing, to add a floating dock on here. This would all get replaced. And that's, that's for our future is this is what we hope to do. And our boat would be here, and then the other boat would be on the inside. And again, this is Mr. Harrington's building. This is Water Street, and this is Lucy Street. And then the observation deck for Willow Park is right here. So we feel this is the best thing. I don't want to be out um, up ri river towards the mouth of the Lake Michigan because my target audience is here. Yeah. So that's why I want to be close to town. Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> great, great spot. City, City of Sorry Turk has been so good to us about this. Um, we have power there and it's been a great working relationship and we hope to continue that. So now, if you want to see the uh, what about our boat and the police boat, would be uh, down at Coffin Park. Uh, I can't see we're not sure where we can dock it because of, of uh, the situation down there. Uh, so you might not be able to get on board that we could last year, but uh, if you come down to Coffin Park tonight, because we're celebrating uh, National Night Out, which is a uh, nationwide uh, community thing where uh, police, fire, and other uh, first responders are getting together and show off their equipment. Uh, we will have a side-by-side uh, -side, uh, light burn. We'll be burning two rooms. One is sprinkled, one is not sprinkled. So you can see how fast that room goes. It takes you three minutes to get out on your table. And you will see that how fast it goes. And if it's not sprinkled, but if it's sprinkled, what time? Between six and, six and eight. And there's food, there's, you know, the county has all the equipment there. And uh, as I said, it's a, just to recognize all first responders. Also a tug of war between you guys and the fleet. We just got our works out for it, please. It takes 20 firefighters to do a job that one police officer does. Where is this located? It's at Coughlin Park on Calder Street. Calder and Griffith, 303 Calder Street. And what time is this? 6 to 8. 6 to 8. And there's hot dogs and there's, yeah, kids 
still love it because we've got a big bounce all set day long. This and people love going through some of the county SWAT trucks. They've got these unbelievable vehicles.